closes down at four or something. Is that right? Or is, that, or is it even earlier? Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Dokie. How are you guys doing? Good. So far so good? All right, well, it's truly, truly wonderful to be back. I think this is my sixth or seventh uh, time lecturing at this uh, winter school. Uh, it's been one of the really uh, great lecturing pleasures that I've had over all these years. And uh, I thank uh, Eliezer for uh, making this thing so great for us so many years. And I'm delighted, delighted to be back. Um, what I want to do is, uh, uh, is really talk about one uh, sort of structural topic. Uh, the uh, structural topic is um, how, to, uh, how to think about the important observables that we talk about in fundamental physics. Uh, if you're a particle physicist, the, the, most, uh, the most important observable that you, that you talk about are what our, uh, our experimental friends measure at colliders are, uh, are, are scattering amplitudes. Um, if you're a cosmologist, probably the most important observable are, uh, well, they're broadly speaking cosmological correlation functions, um, but there are uh, but there are things that involve uh, looking at spatial correlations in the sky today. Um, uh, most famously, you look at things like density perturbations, um, two-point functions of density perturbations, higher-point functions of density perturbations. The two-point functions have been measured. Um, that's the fact that there's a one part in a hundred thousand difference between the temperature in the, of the CMB in one spot in the sky and the other. Um, uh, the higher point correlation functions or the non-Gaussianities are something that have not yet been seen, but which, uh, uh, which the sort of next 20, 30 years of, uh, of the experimental program of cosmology is going to tell us something about and potentially has enormous amount of uh, uh, information. Um, and uh, what I want to do is tell you uh, really practically speaking, a way of thinking about all of these kinds of uh, observables. We'll start with the more familiar case of uh, observables of relevance to collider physics, the normal scattering uh, amplitudes, um, but also cosmological correlators. Um, from a more invariant point of view than the sort of standard textbook point of view. Uh, the standard textbook point of view uh, thinks about uh, all kinds of these observables as the, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, being computed by some machine. The machine is ultimately the Feynman path integral or something like that. Um, and uh, and uh, you have to, there's a Lagrangian, there's, a, there's Feynman rules, um, and you, uh, you grind through some calculations, often a very long and complicated calculation, to arrive at some answer for an amplitude or a cosmological correlation function. Um, and yet, uh, over the years, People have observed uh, 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 first that the final answers end up being radically simpler than you would expect from staring at the uh, Feynman rules or going through the Feynman diagrams. Uh, that has been seen really a lot in the context of, uh, of, 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 uh, of amplitudes. Um, more recently, it started to be seen also in, in the calculation of cosmological correlation functions, which is at a much, much, much more primitive level of understanding than the analogous uh, uh, computations for uh, colliders. But in any case, uh, uh, so things get even harder, much harder when you do these uh, uh, cosmological calculations. Um, but in the end, the, not only are the final answers 
uh, much simpler. They often have uh, hidden structures, hidden symmetries, all sorts of things that you would not expect uh, uh, ahead of time. And uh, so that that uh, that says that, uh, or uh, it at least motivates thinking that there should be some other way of getting the final answer, where you highlight as much as possible what the underlying physical principles are that uh, that uh, that that the path integral picture is supposed to be manifesting. And the, 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 the ultimate, uh, the underlying physical principles are locality and unitarity. Okay, so uh, what quantum field theory is, is a way of talking about physics in a way that's manifest, as manifestly local and unitary as possible. And when we describe it in conventional language, as we do in textbooks, uh, it involves an, lots of redundancy in our description of the physics. Even for simple scalar field theories, the redundancy is sitting there in field redefinitions. You can have two different field theories. You can even take a free field theory and do some complicated field re redefinition on the free field and get something that appears like a very complicated interacting theory. But in the end, if you actually calculate the physical observables, you'll see that they're all, all the amplitudes are zero because it's secretly free. You see, so, so even, even, uh, 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 even for simple scalar field theories, there is a big redundancy in, in description given by field redefinitions, and it gets much, much worse when we talk about um, theories of massless particles with spin, massless spin one, massless spin two, where in the conventional description we have to in, in include enormous amounts of redundancy, gauge redundancy, diffeomorphism and redundancy, into our description of the physics, so that if you do calculations uh, um, involving the scattering of gluons, you get very complicated expressions. For gravitons, it's mind-bogglingly complicated seeming expressions. Even the Feynman rule for a three-point graviton vertex has like you know, 50 or 100 terms in it or something like that. Like, incredibly complicated. And yet the final answers are much, much simpler. Um, in fact, ironically, the answers are simpler the higher the spin gets. The, in, in a sense, the simplest possible answer is for gravity, then it gets a little more complicated for gluons. And the most complicated one is for uh, scalars. So, um, so the conventional way of uh, doing things in, uh, includes th this uh, large amount of redundancy in our description of the physics. And it's associated with the presence of virtual particles uh, as a crucial part of our uh, normal language and grammar and, uh, of, of, uh, of how we think about what uh, field theory calculations are about. Um, and, but those virtual particles aren't there. They're there in the mind of the theoretical physicist. They're not really there. Uh, they're not, they're, they're, they don't go click, click, click in anyone's detector. So there's a sort of physical idea here. The physical idea that we're going to explore is we want to remove as much of the sort of redundant baggage as possible in trying to uh, describe the physics. We want to describe, to begin with, scattering processes in a way which only ever talks about the physical particles and the onshell states. Uh, and then once we figure out how to do that, um, we'll see how there's a perfect analogy between what happens in particle physics with particle scattering and the questions about uh, um, cosmological correlation functions. And um, now, this is a very large topic, and I have uh, three lectures, so I've decided to make it maximally practical. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, is today, uh, I'm going to review how we think about these things for the case of particle scattering. Um, and conceptually, the most important thing that you're going to learn today is why it is that nature is described by the kinds of theories that we know and love. Why it is that nature is described by uh, theories that have massless uh, particles. In some approximation, we ignore the masses. Massless particles of spin 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and 2. Um, that's the only menu of possibility that's allowed. We're not allowed to have massless particles of spin 17 halves um, and so on. We'll understand why the mass of spin 2 particle, there can only be one of them and it's the graviton. Why mass of spin 1, the, the, they have to have the yang mills structure. Mass of spin 3 half is possible, but we can have at most eight of them and it's supersymmetry. <laughs> okay, so all those things we're going to get as like a quick algebraic check inputting directly a physics of locality and unitarity and completely sidestepping the entire construction of Lagrangians and path integrals and Feynman rules. Okay? And uh, uh, so this is conceptually important. Um, we'll talk about how to do this for massless particles. We'll talk about how to do it for massive particles. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's, that's something relatively new um, uh, just in the last couple of years, uh, how to have a useful, workable formalism 
for doing all the same things that we've done for a long time with massless particles for massive particles. So I'll, I'll introduce that formalism uh, today as well. Uh, and so, uh, so, so, so the, the conceptually most important part is, is, is what I just said, but also has practical consequences. You know, if you're a, if you're a phenomenologist, often you really want to have some idea of, uh, well, uh, you know, you, you, let, let me just give you an example of something that we're going to do in like 30 seconds by the end of this lecture, if I actually get, get going. Let's say you're interested, well, this is not, I'm deliberately making it more complicated, but uh, let's say there's some spin three halves excitation of, a, of the top quark in some kind of composite model, okay? Uh, and let's say I'm, I'm interested in photo production of, uh, this, is not a, this is not an initial state that we really uh, care about that much at uh, colliders, and this is not a final state that we care about that much either. I'm just, uh, uh, I'm just doing one to uh, illustrate something that looks naively scary. Okay, so I want to have uh, the cross section or the amplitude for photon top goes through this spin three half resonance of the top, excited state of the top, and uh, decaying to a graviton on the top. Okay, now how many of you would be scared of that calculation? Okay, I think we'd all be very scared of this calculation. Um, and MadGraph doesn't know how to do it. Okay, um, uh, because we have to go give it the Lagrangian. God knows what the Lagrangian is for this. So many fucking indices, you know, it's like a <laughs> complete disaster. Okay, and we're going to write this down in 30 seconds. Okay, so these are trivialities. These are absolute trivialities. And, um, and uh, um, in fact, the, the, the sort of harder ones involve uh, uh, massless particles that we know and love. These ones are sort of trivial examples. Okay? And so that's a practical thing you'll get out of this lecture. You'll know, be able to compute every 2 to 2 amplitude in the standard model by hand yourself. Okay? No Lagrangians, no Feynman rules. You can just write them down, lickety split. We'll do some of them, and you can do the rest of them yourself uh, for exercises. It's really easy. All right, so that's our goal for uh, that's our goal for today, and maybe some of uh, some of uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, there's actually another aspect of the uh, uh, so so the, the collider physics on the Earth is sort of obvious. We're talking about uh, this on shell way of talking about scattering processes. I've mentioned one aspect of an analogy. Uh, as I said, there's a perfect analogy between uh, between uh, amplitudes and a cosmological. Uh, correlations specifically of the sort that are generated by inflation. Okay, so if we believe that inflation is right, we have lots of evidence that inflation is right. If we believe that inflation is right, that people say all the time that the energy scale during inflation was incredibly high, so it's kind of like we have an accelerator up there near the scale of Hubble during inflation. The scale of Hubble during inflation could be as high as 10 to the 14 GeV, and so you can ask, in what concrete practical sense is inflation a collider. You know, when you have a collider, you can discover new particles, resonances, measure their mass, their spin, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, what is the analog of that in inflation? So we're going to talk very precisely about what the analog of that is for inflation. Um, how we can detect, potentially, the presence of new particles that have a mass near Hubble during inflation. So maybe mass near 10 to the 14 GeV. Um, and we detect them from the analog of the scattering amplitudes that are these non-Gaussian. So, so I'm going to sort of set up a perfect parallel between particle scattering and cosmological uh, uh, correlators. And this on-shell, no virtual particle way of talking about particle scattering has a cousin of uh, exactly the same thing uh, in the context of cosmology. And there, we were going to figure out how to compute all of these correlators without ever talking about time, without ever talking about time evolution, without ever seeing a single integral dt anywhere. Now you're doing cosmology, you think the most important thing you see are integrals dt, because things are coming from cosmological time evolution, and that's exactly the, the point. The analog of no virtual particles is no time. Okay, we're going to find a completely sort of uh, spatial way of talking about all of these, uh, of talking about all these uh, uh, correlation functions. And just as what we're going to see for amplitudes is a tremendous shortcut into writing down the final answer, it's an even bigger shortcut for writing down the final answer in the context of cosmology, and it gives uh, very physically well-motivated templates for patterns of non-Gaussianities that our experimental friends can look for in order to probe for the 
potentially the presence of new particles near 10 to the 14 GeV um, by using the, the uh, inflation as a cosmological collider. Okay, so, so those are the two main topics uh, about the colliders on the Earth and in the sky. In between, at some point in the middle tomorrow, uh, I might allude, if I have time, to an intermediate kind of uh, collider physics. There's an astrophysical kind of collider physics that people have been very excited about in the past, uh, uh, ever since LIGO observed uh, gravitational waves. The sort of collisions of black holes or the collisions of neutron stars, um, etc. And uh, so that's not going to be the sort of focus of these lectures, but, I'll, but, um, but as we're going along, uh, we're going to, as we, uh, as we discover how we're talking about, as we discover how to talk about massive particles, and how to talk about massive particles with spin in particular, uh, we're going to discover something quite lovely that, uh, that uh, there's, a, there's a specific sense in which there's a kind of most elementary particle with spin that you could talk about at large spin. There's the most elementary possible interaction that a particle of a spin a million can have, let's say, with a graviton. There's a notion of minimal coupling that's natural from the point of view that we're talking about now, which is not natural from the Lagrangian point of view. You would not guess it from the Lagrangian point of view, but from this sort of on shell point of view, we're going to be led to a notion of minimal coupling. Um, it's quite beautiful, it's very simple, and then you can ask the question, is there any particle in nature that is minimally coupled? And that, that question has a wonderful answer. The answer is care black holes. Okay, so care black holes, when looked at from far away, spinning black holes, and almost all astrophysical black holes are big spinning black holes out there, okay? Uh, spinning black holes um, are viewed from far enough away are elementary particles that are minimally coupled in the sense that we'll discover from the amplitude's point of view. And this actually gives a lot of insight into the origin of the care solution to begin with. So that's going to be uh, a sort of a little, uh, an intermediate sort of pause on, on astrophysical colliders in the sky. I think it's really cool that we're going to go from very basic questions about what a particle is to discovering what's special about care black holes as the sort of uh, most elementary uh, particle of spin that you could imagine. All right, so that's the plan. You had a question already, which is very surprising because I haven't said anything, no. but uh, yeah. Maybe yeah. I was confused, but <coughs> you said that, uh, of course, one of the basic attributes of uh, QT is uh, unitarity. Yes. Which is uh, correct, uh, which correlated to causality. Yes. But well, there, there are two separate things. There's unitarity, locality, and causality. Yes. So how this is uh, connected to the time? Uh, excellent question. Wait till the wait. The, an excellent question that will be an, that will be answered when we talk about where time comes from and this other way of doing things. That's uh, uh, in fact just to give you a, uh, just to give a teaser ahead of time. That's going to be the whole point. We're going to have to see from a purely spatial point of view how do we account for words like particle production and so on that we normally think are crucially tied to time evolution. It's a beautiful answer to that question that we'll see. Okay. Um, but uh, but the, the sort of teaser is that these cosmological questions turn out to contain scattering amplitudes as a special case inside them. This is a very surprising thing. It should not at all be obvious. Um, it's, it'll be mathematically obvious when we start talking about it. But all these cosmological questions aren't different. They're slight extensions of the question about amplitudes, and they actually contain the scattering amplitudes in them. Okay, so everything that we're going to understand about amplitudes is sitting there as part of the answer in some appropriate analytic continuation, a part of the answer of these cosmological correlators. So these subjects are deeply related to each other. It's not some superficial analogy that I'm drawing. They're deeply related. In fact, one of them is contained in the other. Everything about the scattering amplitudes is actually contained inside the, cos inside the cosmological objects. One final bit of, uh, <coughs> one final philosophical comment. Um, <coughs> something that, uh, that, um, certainly many of my friends and I have been spending many years uh, thinking about, is, uh, a, is a much more adventurous aspect of this, uh, of this uh, sort of offshoot of these observations. You begin by observing that the final answers for amplitudes or maybe cosmological correlators are vastly simpler than you would expect. Um, they have hidden symmetries, blah, blah, blah. And so then you start wondering whether uh, whether there might just be some completely different question to which these formulas are the answer. Um, and, uh, uh, and so the whole point is that you're not inputting unitarity and locality. You have to find some totally different question. Uh, there are kind of strange questions. You have to get used to living in these weird spaces to ask these funny questions. But we've been seeing more and more and more examples over the last 10 years of interesting kinds of mathematical questions and 
combinatorics, algebraic geometry, number theory, all sorts of crazy parts of math that have never had anything to do with physics before uh, in any in very direct way, showing up in this very basic physics, you find some funny question to ask in the space that labels the, the, uh, the momenta of the scattering particles, for example, the very boring seeming space of n null momenta. What can you do in the space of n null momenta? Well, somehow in the space of n null momenta, you find some interesting mathematical questions to ask whose answer ends up being amplitudes that have locality and unitarity in them. So locality and unitarity are sort of emergent things that come out. They're not put in. Okay? We're not going to be talking about in these lectures at all. Okay? I'm going to talk about uh, completely responsible things. So what we're doing is 100% responsible. Anyone who's been in theoretical physics long enough knows that there's responsible and irresponsible work. Okay? So, and they're not deeply unrelated to each other because you have to sometimes do a lot of responsible work to set things up so that you're understanding what's going on as cleanly, as clearly as possible, so that you can make some leap to do something irresponsible that doesn't land you in the mouth of a horrible shark that's going to eat you up. Okay, so, um, so we're not going to talk anything about uh, uh, fancy irresponsible things. We're going to speak perfectly responsibly about, but which means non-redundantly talking only about physical objects, uh, only using on-shell ideas. Um, and see how far we can get uh, with that. We're also going to focus our attention mostly on the very simplest scattering processes as well as uh, cosmological correlators. So I'll be talking about three particle and four particle amplitudes and correlators. Okay? Uh, not, more, uh, not more complicated things. Okay, so any other questions? All right, so we can actually start. So, <clears throat> Uh, so, so as I said, today I'm going to talk about uh, about particle scattering amplitudes, and the first thing that we have to do is um, the first thing we have to do is uh, answer the question: What is a particle? Okay, now, um, before sort of jumping into, the, so the, uh, the, I don't mean anything uh, very philosophical about this. Um, what, we're, what we're going to see in a moment is what you're all familiar with, that if you have a massive particle, a massive particle is labeled by its spin. So if you have a massive spin, one particle can have sort of three spin polarizations, whereas massless particles are labeled by helicity. Okay, massless particles can only, a massive spin, one particle can have two, two uh, polarizations or two helicities. Okay? Um, so we're going, to, we're going to review that story, uh, but we're going to do, we're going to, uh, uh, <clears throat> so this is a story of Wigner's little group. But bef before uh, jumping into it, I want to stress why this is such an important like zeroth order thing to uh, talk about, because right here is where the normal way of thinking about quantum field theory makes a very fateful decision. Okay, so uh, so I want you to see what we're not going to be seeing for the for these uh, lectures. See, the very word quantum field theory has field in it, and you know almost all the certainly all the older textbooks will tell you the fields are fundamental and particles are excitations of the field. Okay. Um, okay, well, in that way of doing things, um, let's say you're talking about, uh, let's actually jump to, to the non-trivial non example. Let's say you're talking about uh, uh, spin one particles. Okay? If you're talking about a, a, a spin one particle, then what you're supposed to do using Feynman diagrams is compute something that has uh, a vector index. Let's say I have a bunch of uh, n an amplitude involving n spin 1 particles, they have a bunch of vector indices, right? So these amplitudes that we compute from Feynman diagrams are Lorentz covariant tensors, right? They have these vector indices, right? And that's because these things come from, ultimately, uh, correlation functions of fields. These have to do with a mu. Now, we don't see the fields when we are, you know, the field doesn't go click, click, click in a photon detector. The photon goes click, click, click in a photon detector. So uh, how do we convert this? How do we convert this to an actual 
physical amplitude. What do you do in courses? There's a word. Polarization vector, right? So polarization vector, so, so you say that, that, that uh, depending on the spin state or helicity state of the particle, you contract this with a bunch of polarization vectors. Okay? Now, the reason we do that, we're going to sort of expose uh, a little more explicitly here, because precisely the point is that amplitudes are not Lorentz tensors. Okay? They don't transform only under the Lorentz group. We're going to learn in a second that amplitudes have the property that when you do a Lorentz transformation on them, on the momenta, you get a little group transformation on the amplitude. So they, they, they're, they're sort of bifundamental. They transform both under the Lorentz group and under the little group. And okay, so this is already slightly annoying, right? Because this is what you compute. You do all the work with Feynman diagrams to compute that, and you're not done. At the very end, you have to dot into these polarization vectors, okay? Now, even when you have a massive spin one particle, this is slightly annoying because this polarization vector has how many components? Four components. And yet the massive spin one particle has three components. So this polarization vector is not, <coughs> is not, a, is not generic. It's constrained, right? It, it, there has to be some constraint on it. Normally, the constraint we impose is something like epsilon dot p equals zero. OK? Now, what if you have a massive spin one particle? Massive spin one particle is even worse than that because the massive spin one particle only has two polarizations. And so it, we're just screwed when you have a massless uh, spin one particle. There is no such thing as the polarization vector for a massless spin one particle. Okay? And that's because there's just no way of doing it. This is the only uh, Lorentz invariant condition that we can put on it. We go from four to three components. And <clears throat> if you say, well, what are you talking about? Uh, I know what the polarization vector is for a particle moving, a massless particle moving in the z direction. And I even, I'm so smart, I even know there's some plus or minus i over root 2, OK? Um, and so that's what the polarization vector is, OK? So what are you talking about? There it is. Uh, here is the problem. If you do some, an appropriate Lorentz transformation on this, which is related to the little group we're about to, to talk about, this, you can do a, Lorentz, a sequence of Lorentz transformations that brings the momentum back to itself. So let's say that the, that the momentum was E00E. Zero, zero, e. There was some Lorentz transformation that leaves E00E zero, zero, e alone. But after that sequence of, uh, after that Lorentz transformation, this will not go back to itself. The problem is those zeros don't mean anything in a Lorentz invariant way. I can, in some other, after I do some uh, Lorentz transformation on, on, on this guy, this can go to some to some alpha, this, this, and the same alpha. So in other words, when you do a Lorentz transformation on a polarization vector, it doesn't just go to itself. It can go to itself plus something proportional to the momentum of the particle. OK, and this is allowed. This keeps epsilon dot p equals 0 because p squared equals 0. OK? And you'll, of course, recognize that this is the same this is the momentum space version of a gauge transformation. OK? So up to some eyes that I'm, I'm not being careful about. So the problem is when you have, so already for massive spin 1, it's already annoying because the polarization vector is constrained. Epsilon dot p equals zero. For massless spin one, it's worse because the polarization vector itself, it satisfies epsilon dot p equals zero, but it's, but it's not unique. Epsilon, instead you have to, you have to uh, talk about an equivalence class of polarization vectors where I identify epsilon as the same as epsilon plus anything times p mu. <laughs> So you can't uniquely label a photon with a, a, a polarization with a polarization vector. You can only label it with this whole equivalence class of, uh, of polarization vectors. And therefore, if you want the actual answer, uh, you, you see you're getting fooled into thinking that all you have to do to make something Lorentz invariant is take this, uh, is, is take this tensor and dot it into these polarization vectors. But if the particle is massless, that's not guaranteed to be Lorentz invariant. 
Because if you do a Lorentz transformation, the epsilon can shift around in this equivalence class. Therefore, to have physical Lorentz invariants, you have to impose a constraint. Whatever the theory is that spits out these m mu's has to have the constraint that if you dot, if you replace any one of these epsilons by another one in its equivalence class, you get the same answer, which is the statement that p mu m mu is equal to zero. This is the on-shell word identity. Except here we haven't talked about Lagrangians and gauge invariants and any of those, those things. We've just, uh, for any sort of general strategy for trying to build an amplitude from Lorentz covariant objects that we then dot into polarization vectors to get the answer, we just have this problem that the, that, that the polarization vectors aren't unique. Only the, we can only talk about the equivalence class. And so we have to have these very constrained kinds of theories that make this happen. Okay, so, uh, so all of this is a consequence of the primacy of fields, right? What are these, I mean, where does this come from for massive spin one particle? That's the equation of motion, right? You have an a mu and you have box a mu plus m squared a mu equals zero and that from there you can derive the d mu a mu equals zero. Okay, so, um, and similarly here, that this is the, the uh, for the underlying Maxwell field, you have, uh, uh, you have the, gauge transformations, and so these things leave, uh, leave the uh, field strengths invariant. So if you want to think in terms of an, uh, an underlying field, then the word polarization vector makes an appearance. You have these things that are Lorentz tensors that you contract into polarization vectors to make actual particle amplitudes. By the way, massive spin a half has a similar annoyance, right? It, you know, um, probably w w when many of you first run into the Dirac equation or you think about the even computing Compton scat scattering and QED, maybe it has bothered you, some of you, that you're carrying around these four component objects everywhere. Why do we have four component objects when the electron only has two spins? It's stupid. There's no reason to have four components. There aren't four components in the answer. Okay? That's another artifact of the fact that we're using this Grassmann field, and then we put this on shell condition on it in order to uh, describe the actual particle. Okay? So, so, we're now going to talk about what the particles really are. We're going to talk about the transformation properties of the particles. But, uh, but I went through this uh, interlude just to see what, what, what we're going to buy. We're never going to see a polarization vector. We're never going to see U bars and Vs or any of that kind of stuff that you're used to when you talk about uh, uh, spin, spin a half particles. Um, and in fact, uh, life is very good in four dimensions because in four dimensions, the massless little group is just a U1. The massive little group is just SU2, so thankfully those are the simplest possible groups there are, so we can just count on our fingers without doing anything fancier. You certainly are not going to have to drag 4 by 4 matrices around in your head. Okay? Um, and, uh, uh, and, but that's the sort of a key conceptual point, is that we're not thinking in terms of fields with on-shell conditions that turn them into particles. We're going to directly talk about the particles. Yes? Gauge transformation of a mu, I mean, allows you to choose that a times p, uh, d mu a mu equals yes, yes, that's right. But that's a specific gauge choice, right? I mean, so why would I expect this this thing that you said about epsilon mu only invariant after adding p to be a basic property of m if I also want m to be a gauge invariant thing? Because then I might want to be, I cannot break it. You, you can, you can, we, we can, uh, so since, since it's a redundant way of talking about things, there are many different ways of, of, choose, of, uh, of fixing the redundancy. I've, I've given the kind of most standard simple one, but you can, you, you, you can try other ways as well. The whole point is that we're not going to even have to talk about it. Okay? We're not going to, we're not going to use this language at all. All right, so, okay, so just trying to give you a sense for, uh, the sort of conceptual difference right from the beginning. Okay, so, so what is Wigner's argument for what, what a particle is? So, uh, so again, now we're asking what is a particle again? Uh, and this is all a la, uh, a la Wigner and uh, it's in Weinberg's uh, uh, field theory one. And um, a lot of the material in this lecture uh, is, I think, reasonably pedagogically done in a paper I wrote a couple years ago 
called Scattering Amplitudes for All Masses and Spins. Okay, so uh, we're, a, a lot of the stuff in this lecture is coming from that, from that uh, paper. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so, so the, the mathematical answer to this question is that a particle is actually an irreducible representation of the Poincaré group. <laughs> Okay. And um, that mathematical answer is actually not very far from the, uh, from the intuitive everyday answer. Uh, we normally think that a particle is maybe some like lump of mass and energy that can maybe move. Okay. Um, uh, but implicit in that picture are space-time symmetries. Okay. After all, why do we give the same, why do we, uh, why do we, say, the, why do we say the electron for the electron here? And we use the same name for the electron here. We, we say it's the electron in both cases. Why? Because of translational invariance. <laughs> okay. And uh, why do we say that, that the electron moving in the z direction is the same as the electron moving in the x direction? Because of rotational invariance. And you see, let's say I put on a gigantic magnetic field in the z direction. <laughs> then it would be really dumb to call them both electrons. <laughs> Because they do completely different things. Whether they are firing this way, they go in little circles. If they go this way, they just go uh, straight up, right? So they do sort of completely different things. If you badly break rotational invariance, it's not useful to call them the same thing anymore. Okay? So, um, so the reason why we give them the same names are because of space-time symmetries. Okay? And so uh, we have the space-time symmetry. Uh, and we want to find unitary representations of it because the world is quantum mechanical, so we want to find unitary representations of the uh, Poincaré group. The first thing that we do is we diagonalize translations. Okay, so diagonalizing translations is easy. So if I have a translation by an amount a mu, okay, um, then uh, I want to have some states p mu such that p on p is equal to e to the i p dot a p. So that's the simplest action you can have for a translation. So that's why we use momentum eigenstates, right? So, uh, so momentum eigenstates are used because we have translations. We're, 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 we're diagonalizing the action of uh, translations. And there might be some other indices here too. And we don't know what those indices are yet. So now we'd like to figure out what those other indices can possibly be. So this was the question Wigner asked. So let's say I have a state that's labeled by p mu and sigma. We want to know, uh, and I have some Lorentz transformation now, lambda. Wigner wanted to know, uh, how do I act? How does the Lorentz transformation act on this guy? Okay, and now what, yes. Doesn't matter. We haven't specified it yet. Because we, if, if we have massless representation, there will have enhanced space-time symmetry, like symmetry, right? And the states there would be different. Would be no, no. I'm, I'm. Uh, we, we just because you have massless particles does not mean you have conformal symmetry no, at all. Right. Uh, and uh, and uh, so, in fact, we're 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 only going to be the. Uh, we don't have a notion of particle when we have conformal symmetry. We do have a notion of particle when we have Poincaré symmetry. The real world does not have conformal symmetry. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, that, sorry, I, I forgot to say, this is a lecture about the real world. Okay? So these lectures are about the real world. That, uh, um, I know, that this, is, this is an unusual thing in theoretical physics these days. But anyway, it is, it is actually meant to be about the actual real world. The real world does not have a smidgen of conformal symmetry in it. Um, okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, we want to know the action of a Lorentz transformation on P. And so what is the first... What's the first, uh, what's the most naive guess for what this would be? The most naive guess is that it would just transform P. Right? But, but you know that this is wrong. You know that this is wrong because you know, just intuitively, that if I have, let's say, a photon moving in the z direction, that if I do a rotation around the z direction, I should pick up a phase because the photon is a spin, right? So it can't just be that when you act with a, with a general Lorentz transformation that I just transform the momentum. I have to pick up some kind of phase or some spin information about what the spin of the particle is. So this cannot be the general answer. 
This is the answer for a spin zero particle that maybe has some internal quantum numbers, charge, other global symmetries, whatever, right? But, but this cannot be the uh, general answer. Okay, so in order to give the uh, general answer, uh, this, is what you have, this is what you have to do. I'll just say it uh, quickly, but um, I want to go through this because when we introduce these uh, spinner helicity variables for both masses and massive particles in a moment, you're going to see that the purpose in life of these variables is not just some sort of clever trick for representing massless and massive particles. The purpose in life is to make the action of the little group manifest. Okay, okay. So, um, so the first thing that you do is you choose some reference momentum k mu, some reference momentum, and, and you choose uh, to write p mu as some particular Lorentz transformation that depends on p and perhaps what your choice of k is on k. So you have to choose it. This is not unique, right? It's not unique precisely because, for example, if something's moving in the z direction, I can also rotate around the uh, z direction, right? So I have to make a choice. So having made that choice, we're now going to define P and sigma, this is a definition. P and sigma is going to be U of L of P on K and sigma. And now, well, the reason this is a definition is that the sigmas here are the same. If you like, for each momentum, there's some set of other labels that I can have, and I have to tell you how I'm matching up the labels from one momentum to another. Okay, so this is how I'm doing it. This is a definition. You give me k, and I'm defining p of sigma to be this u of l on k. All right, now we can ask a question. Now we can ask, what happens when I take a general Lorentz transformation and I act it? What happens when I take a general u of lambda on p and sigma? Okay, well, this is u of lambda u of L of P, K, K and sigma, right? And now clearly you want this to be u of L of lambda P on something, right? But it is not. So let's make it look as much like that as we can. So I'm going to write as u of lambda of LP and then a u of lambda of LP inverse lambda L. Sorry. Um, uh, yes. Sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, I, I wanted to do it. Uh, sorry. I, I meant to say thank you. L of lambda P. Sorry? The, the U that you wrote, the same, U of lambda is the same oper operator as U of L, right? Sorry? The, the fact that you use the U there is purposeful, right? I mean, yes, U. That, that for, every, for every Lorentz transformation, there's a U of lambda. Yeah, okay? Then you wrote yeah. U of L, and I'm saying, yeah. you are saying that this is. I'm saying that this is this is what I, this is what I most super naively would have thought, right? Because uh, because this is going to take me from k to lambda p, right? So I'm just writing that, and it's and it's inverse. Okay. Okay. So 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 I have not done anything so far. Okay. But this guy is an interesting transformation. Let's call that guy W. Okay. Now what does W do? W. Okay. W on K is equal to what? See, W takes W takes K to P to lambda P, then back to K. Okay, so W on K is actually equal to K. And therefore, this thing, this acting on k and sigma, is not going to change k, but it can, root, it can mix up these sigma indices. Okay? So in fact, u of w 
on k and sigma can be some, using Weinberg's notation here, d sigma sigma prime that could depend on w, k and sigma prime. And after we know that, now we, now we know that, y, that u of lambda on p and sigma is equal to d sigma sigma prime of w, p and sigma prime. So this is the final answer that we wanted. Okay. We now know how to do a general Lorentz transformation on a general state, but what we get is a linear combination of the, sorry, that's lambda p. Okay. And what is this d sigma sigma prime? Well, this is, this is nothing other than a representation of the group of w's with w dot w k equals k. So this is the little group. All right, so, so what are the easy cases? The easy cases, uh, so, so let's say that k is massive. Okay, then, for example, I can take k mu equals to m0, let's say. Okay. Then what is the little group? If I'm in d space-time dimensions, then, uh, then the group of w that leave k invariant are just the spatial rotations, SO d minus 1. Okay, yeah. So in that formula, the right hand side can be completed without an explicit knowledge of lambda? Sorry? No, no, it, that, that lambda depends on, uh, w depends on lambda. w is this particular combination of guys, okay? Okay, so given uh, w is that, that particular uh, uh, combination of guys, but the point is that that these d's have to furnish a representation of the little group, okay? because they're not any old Lorentz transformation. They're that, those Lorentz transformations that keep k invariant. All right, if k is massless, the situation is a little more interesting. I won't go through, I won't go through the, uh, uh, I mean, we can just mechanically write down all the generators and see what leads, leaves a null momentum invariant. Let's say you take k mu equals now e0, blah, blah, blah or e e0. <clears throat> but I'll give you some, uh, I'll give you an intuition for why uh, this is, why, why, uh, why, for what, what, what the answer is. So, uh, so if you think about SOD minus one as the symmetries of a sphere, um, and that's what you get when you, that's what you get uh, uh, when KMU is this, uh, 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 it, it is in the rest frame. Now, if you boost this k more and more and more, then you get the uh, you get the symmetries of a sphere whose radius gets bigger and bigger and bigger. In the limit, as you boost infinitely much to go to uh, to go to uh, uh, a massless particle, you don't see the curvature of the sphere anymore. So what you have instead of the symmetries of a sphere is you have the symmetries of the Euclidean plane. Okay, so the, so the uh, the asymmetries become that of a Euclidean d minus two plane. I forget what it's called. Okay, you see they have the same number of generators. Okay, so they have exactly the same amount of symmetry. The the amount of symmetry doesn't drop as you go from massless to uh, to a massive. Um, but there is something very peculiar about these representations for massless particles. So let me uh, so let me uh, illustrate uh, in d equals four. Okay. So in d equals four, uh, the symmetries of the uh, Euclidean two plane. Well, I have translations. I have translations in x and y, and I have the rotation around the z-axis. And so these, these commutation relations are just Tx and Ty is zero, and Tx and Jz is negative Ty, and Ty and Jz is Tx. 
Okay? But importantly, the translations commute with each other. And so you can label any representation of, of this uh, symmetry by the eigenvalues of Tx and Ty. Okay, so any representation, uh, it has, I can, I can label any state by the, by the eigenvalues of Tx and Ty. But let's say that these eigenvalues are generic. Then by doing a rotation, I should have all of these states. All of these states should be in an irrep because I can get from one to the other just by doing the JZ transformation. So that means that the generic representations are continuously infinite dimensional. And we haven't seen these in nature. But well, we don't know exactly. So they, 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 they're, they're, they're uh, massless particles with uh, um, what, one, one way of talking about them is an infinite tower of massless particles of higher and higher spin. If you go to the Fourier basis, you can think of this as just an infinite set of massless particles. Okay? Or, anyway. So, but uh, uh, we haven't seen them in nature. Um, there's various arguments that they're sick. They haven't been resolved entirely yet. Um, so, but in any case, so we're, we're going to ignore these things. Uh, at least for the moment, we have not... Um, uh, we haven't seen anything that they're good for. We haven't seen them in, uh, in uh, nature. The only way to avoid having this infinity is to have the Tx and Ty eigenvalues at the origin. Yes? Yes? Oh, and that's very easy. I mean, uh, because we, we're now going to talk about producing what... what, what uh, ask me this question after we figure, after we throw out most of the other theories to begin with. Okay, we're going to throw out massless spin 17 half. We're going to throw out all those things because it, it's going to be the same things. It's going to be the same, same kind of argument. So it'll be, it's, nobody has yet written down consistently factorizing four particle amplitudes involving these guys, even though you can write down three particle amplitudes involving them. Okay? So, but it hasn't been proven to be impossible either. Of course, it's a little more subtle, uh, um, but it's the same strategy. It's the same philosophy. Okay? So we don't have to write down Lagrangians. We will not be writing down Well, I mean, it, it's uh, yeah. Uh, what 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 can I tell you that there's there's uh, other than what I just said? <laughs> so, um, but but if we take these things to the origin, if we take these things to the origin, then we don't have this problem anymore. But those representations are now what are those? In four dimensions, they're just labeled by eigenvalues of J Z now, right? So that's just helicity. And in general, in D dimensions, if I take all the T eigenvalues to zero. So in general, I either get these uh, so-called continuous spin representations. If I don't want to have the continuous spin representations, then I just have, uh, um, if I don't want to have this, then I have SOD minus 2. Because okay. I lose two of these, uh, I lose two of these directions, and I just have the remaining rotations. OK. Now. I want to stress this discontinuous difference between massless and massive. So that, that's quite a striking thing, right? Massless and massive particles are discontinuously different when they have spin. They have discontinuously different numbers of degrees of freedom. Massive spin 1 has 3 degrees of freedom. Massless spin 1 has 2 degrees of freedom. In fact, not even 2. It strictly has 1 degree of freedom. And the reason we say 2 is because almost all the theories we know and love have parity. Okay, so so, uh, so we don't have chiral theories of, of uh, massless spin 1 particles. Um, why don't we have chiral theories of massless spin 1 particles? Well, that's one of the things that we'll discover. <laughs> okay? but, uh, so we don't have to know about Lagrangian. We'll discover why we can't have chiral theories of massless spin 1 particles. But we can have chiral theories of massless spin, of, uh, massless spin half particles, of course. Okay? Um, so really, they only have one degree of freedom. But when you have parity, uh, we sort of conveniently think of them as having two. But they certainly don't have three degrees of freedom. Okay? This discontinuous difference and, and for spin 2, massless spin 2 is 2 degrees of freedom, massive spin 2 is 5 degrees of freedom. This discontinuous difference between massless and massive is not an exaggeration to say this is at the heart of like almost all of the important conceptual aspects of 20th century physics. <laughs> okay? that, uh, this discontinuous difference we've already alluded to is exactly why if you attempt 
to describe theories for massless spin one particles or massless spin two particles with conventional Lagrangian pictures, they have to have a lot of extra redundancy, gauge redundancy, diffeomorphism redundancy, and so on, in order to account for this discontinuous difference in the number of degrees of freedom. This is the reason why the sort of end note to this entire story is the discovery of the Higgs particle. Okay, that, uh, that, uh, that when we want to, uh, when we go from a, a mass of particles at low energies, we naively think kinematically, especially as particle physicists, when we smash things into each other at very high energies, we, we can ignore the mass. So when we go to really high energies, I should be able to ignore the mass, and the particles would just go, I should be able to treat them as massless. But because of this discontinuous difference between masses and massive, I can't quite do that. Okay? That there's extra degrees of freedom. It's not purely kinematics. It's, there's extra degrees of freedom associated uh, with massive particles that have to be correctly accounted for as you go from very low energies to uh, high energies. Okay? So this, so this, uh, this, the story of what is a particle and the difference between masses and massive has a lot of drama uh, associated with it. Okay, so. So, so given that, that's what, that's what a particle is. It's an irrap of the little group. And so now we can say what an amplitude is. So let's say, uh, to begin with, I'm just going to talk about amplitudes for massless particles. So um, let's say I have some amplitude where the particles of, of helicities h1 through hn and momenta p1 through pn. So that's the real label of an amplitude. Now I'm in four dimensions. I'm just using helicity. Okay. So I'll, I'll be working in four dimensions for most for for the entire rest of the lectures. Okay. So the amplitude does not have a Lorentz index in it, right? That's a helicity index. And what is its transformation property? Its transformation property is that m h1 through hn, if I do a Lorentz transformation on the momenta, I have to pick up a little group transformation and with the phase, which we sort of would will conventionally put in e to the 2i h1 theta of w associated with that little group e to the 2i hn theta of w, m h1. So that's the kinematic symmetry an amplitude has to have. When you transform the momenta with the Lorentz transformation, you have to pick up the little group phases uh, according to whatever the helicities the particles have. And to compare again, uh, our attitude to doing this with ordinary polarization vectors is to pretend that some epsilon mu exists such that epsilon mu kind of goes like e to the i theta, maybe it's a polarization vector, 2i theta h uh, um, lambda mu nu epsilon nu. Okay, so we pretend that a polarization vector exists that transforms like, uh, that, uh, that transforms like a Lorentz transformation as well as picking up a little group phase. But as we just said, these polarization vectors don't actually exist for massless particles. Only equivalence classes of them exist. Okay? So, so polarization vectors, when you see a polarization vector, you're doing something redundant. You're, you're not manifesting what the actual amplitude is. That's why most of you have never seen an actual amplitude in your field theory courses. Okay? Uh, you get something, you do a lot of work to compute Feynman rules, you dot into epsilons, and then what? What do you then do? Do you shove in epsilon equals 0, 1 over root 2, i over root 2, 0? Have you ever done that in your life? You probably have never done that in your life. Probably the most you do is you mod square and you do a polarization sum. Okay? You have never seen an actual amplitude. Don't you feel sad? Right? You should, okay? you're, you're now going to see an actual amplitude, right? Because we're not going to talk about them redundantly in this way. Okay? Yes? I, I think just, uh, you wrote h1 times theta. Uh, yes, e to the i. That's right. So. No, I mean, th this is the, this is the, it's, it's a helicity. So if you have a spin a half particle, it would be, it would be, it would be a half. Okay. okay. 
Yeah, this is just a, it's just a convention for what I mean by theta. So, uh, I've defined it so that e to the i theta is what you'd pick up for a spin a half representation. And theta is, yeah. can be, um, is it a matrix or literally a number? No, just literally a number because, because the little group is literally a phase for four dimensions. It's literally a u1. Oh. Okay, by the way, what if we have massive particles? Now, if we have massive particles, um, so uh, here is a, uh, you know, when, 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 when you're an undergraduate, uh, how, are you, how are you used to labeling particles with spin? You're, you're used to labeling them by giving what their, their total spin and maybe the z component of the spin, right? And um, this is kind of a very babyish way of doing things. Uh, actually, uh, it's ironic. It's simultaneously a way too sophisticated and a too babyish way of doing things, <laughs> okay? Um, uh, so uh, why is this no good for us? So now, now I want to talk about, uh, I, want to, uh, I, I now want to tell you what the labels are, how I'm going to talk about amplitudes for massive particles. So to, to begin with, we're just going to have to talk about SU2. We're going to have to talk about uh, rotations in a, in a slightly, a very slightly more grown up way. Okay? This is not good because we don't want our very labeling of the states to break rotational invariance. Right? This is asking us to choose a z direction once and for all. Maybe you can choose a different z direction for the different particles, but we don't want just the very labeling of the states to break rotational invariance. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we're going to uh, label the states simply by, we're going to use a very nice fact about SU2. It's a special case of SUN. So we can label them by tensors. And in fact, the, the states are just symmetric tensors with two s indices. Okay. So if you have a spin s particle, a spin s particle can be represented by giving a wave function. And, and its wave function is just a tensor, which is totally symmetrized in two s indices. OK? That's it. Um, uh, so you can pull out the, the different JZ components just by writing, the, the, by writing this in some basis, right? So, for instance, if I have a spin 3 half particle, uh, it's totally symmetrized in three indices. The indices I can take to be plus and minus. So I can have psi plus plus plus. I can have two pluses and a minus. I can have, uh, I can have these four states. And because it's totally symmetrized, I just have to tell you two pluses and a minus, and I know what all the rest of them are. Okay, so this is just another way of organizing the information <laughs> Uh, that we normally think of by picking a z-axis uh, ahead of time, but we're just going to write a symmetric tensor. All right, so that's what so that's what uh, that's what an amplitude for a massive spin s particles is going to be. Um, uh, it, it will have two s indices. Let's say for particle one, it'll have its own two s index. Another particle might have another j one through j two s two, and so on. Okay. But we're going to think of them, and if we have massless particles, they have their, their, their helicities. Okay? So amplitudes are objects that have helicity indices for the massless particles. They have 2s. There are 2s symmetric tensors for each massive particle of spin s. Okay? So that's the kinematics. That is the kinematics of, that's the kinematic labeling of an amplitude. We'll, we'll, we'll do more explicit examples. In, in a second, but I just want you to see ahead of time what our labeling is going to be. And they have to have the property, when I do a Lorentz transformation on the momenta, I'll pick up the little group rotation on these indices, and I'll pick up the phase on these indices. Is that clear? Okay. Yes. Yes. No, 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 because, because no, no, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the usual thing when, when, you have a, when you have a tensor. I can take a tensor and I can expand it in a given basis. But this way of labeling it is not, uh, is not breaking, is not breaking uh, rotational rate. It's a, it's a trivial point, but, uh, but, it's, it, it is, it, but it's very useful to uh, do it like this. Uh, this is just a little parenthetical remark. This is how spin should be taught to undergraduates. Because actually, if you do this, you see, you're, you're using a lot of special properties of SU2. <laughs> First of all, of, of SUN, and especially SU2, that makes it really simple. 
when you do things like this, you can derive the spherical harmonics. If someone wakes you up in, at 4 a.m. in the middle of the night and, and asks you to write down the generating function for all the spherical harmonics, you can do it in 30 seconds if you think like this. It's harder to do it like the usual way. Of, uh, 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 the, the irony is that the, is that the standard way of teaching SU2 with raising and lowering operators is more sophisticated because it's the way that's actually applicable to any Lie algebra. <laughs> it makes no special use of the simple things for, for SU2. Okay? Um, so, it's, so it's simultaneously uh, too simple and not simple enough. Uh, so you really want to talk about SU2 in a way you remember easily. You do it the same way we do with, with, that, with SUN, and it's especially simple. It's just completely symmetric uh, representations. Yes? For S equals one half, I to S, I'm going to just a single number. Just a, well, it's, well, it's just a psi, psi sub i. That's right. It's just the, and it's like sorry, the, that number is a, it's not a single number. It is the vector. Right? I runs from one to two, or plus ah, to minus. It's, 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 it's the index of the tensor. Nothing. That's right. Scalar, nothing. Right. Okay. Yes. They're not necessarily related to each other. Yeah, that's right. They're, they're, exactly. Yes, yes. Plus one picks up either the plus i theta minus one, either the minus i theta. Exactly. That's what it actually is. I mean, there's nothing to do with uh, so it, whether, if there's. Well, for that, we'll, we'll discover, we're going to discover that, uh, that, that the only consistent theories for interacting massless spin one particles have parity in their couplings. Okay, but it's not a kinematic fact that's forced on us ahead of time. Okay, so, uh, so we have to discover those, those things. Spin statistics, we don't know yet. Okay, all these things come out of this analysis, believe it or not. I'm not going to have time to do all of them, but, but uh, they're actually described in this paper. You, if you go from this way of doing things, everything, you know, all the things that we normally uh, uh, ascribe to commutators vanishing outside light cones and all kinds of stuff like that. We, we can see from one uniform point of view, from the directly writing down local and unitary uh, amplitudes. But anyway, so far we've just uh, talked about uh, kinematics. Okay, so that's what we're going to try to write down directly. We're going to try to get to these objects directly. Um, As I said, you have not seen amplitudes for massless or massive particles. You've not really seen them. Less for most certainly not for massless. I mean, for, for massive, you, you kind of do, but it's still a, a little bit of a pain. Uh, OK. So our goal now is to write down actual amplitudes. So amplitudes are not functions of momenta and polarization vectors. There are functions of something else. We have to find some objects that have the property that when you do a Lorentz transformation on them, they pick up a little group action as well. That's, that's, that's our goal now. Okay. Yes? Sorry? It's also true for the massive case. Yes, that, that's what I said. For both masses and massive cases, we, uh, just, that the, just the, the indexing is different. If it's massless, it only has a helicity index, plus or minus in four dimensions. If it's massive, it has, uh, it, it has some tensor indices totally symmetrized, okay? And that's it. And, that's, that's the, and it has the property that if you take that object and you do a Lorentz transformation on the momenta, you have to pick up the Wigner little group transformation on all the indices, massive and massless. So that's what, a, that's what an amplitude is. Now we want to write down, find variables that manifest that, okay? Okay, so... That's what these spinner helicity variables are about. Okay, so let's begin with massless particles. Okay, so let's say I have a massless p mu uh, with p squared <laughs> equals zero. Um, and the first thing that we're going to do is uh, do this thing that's hopefully familiar to most of you. Um, contract them with the Pauli matrices, including the identity matrix for the zero component. OK, 
Okay, if we do that, we get this uh, two by two matrix. Call this P. Uh, if I write its indices, uh, <coughs> it's written, uh, I write it as alpha and alpha dot. Now, um, if, you, if you've seen this before, great. If you haven't seen it before, do not be scared uh, about these dots. This is like literally alpha runs from one to two, alpha dot runs from one to one dot, two dot. So this matrix, this is literally the one, two, one dot, two dot component. So one, one dot, one, two dot, two, one dot, two, 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 two dot. So that's just uh, a way of uh, labeling the rows and columns of this matrix. Now, um, for before we're saying p squared equals zero, the beautiful thing about this the matrix is that the determinant uh, is that p p is uh, is the most general Hermitian two by two matrix you can have. Okay. And so, if you do a transformation, P goes to L dagger PL for any L. Then I get another Hermitian matrix, right? So therefore, this is equal to sigma mu times some P mu prime. Okay, so this is sigma mu P mu. If I do this transformation, it takes me, so this is some way of transforming p mu to some p mu prime. <clears throat> but we also uh, notice that the determinant of this matrix p is just p squared, just p0 squared minus p3 squared minus p1 squared minus p2 squared. And so if I take the determinant of L to equal 1, then, uh, then the determinant of p dagger uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the determinant of L dagger PL is just equal to the determinant of P. But this means that P prime squared is equal to P squared. So P prime is the Lorentz transformation of P. Okay, so, so that's how we see this beautiful fact that the Lorentz group in four dimensions is SL2C. General linear two by two transformations with unit determinant. So L is okay. not necessarily unitary. L is not unitary. L is not unitary. L is any, that's why I said any L. Uh, if we want, uh, if I want the, uh, if I want to get a Lorentz transformation, I have to say the uh, determinant is one. So now we say L is in SL to C. Okay. By the way, uh, if you have a general complex momentum, for general complex momentum, um, so for a general complex momentum, then I can just take P to any left, P any right. That takes a general complex momentum to another general complex momentum. P squared is still equal to zero if the determinants of L and R are one. Sorry, it's p, p squared is still invariant. And so we see that the general complex Lorentz group is SL2C cross SL2C. And the diagonal subgroup of those guys is uh, the Lorentz group in normal Minkowski space. If you ask both of these matrices to be real, or if you ask P to be a general two by two real matrix, then the determinant of p is p squared in 2 comma 2 signature. And then the Lorentz group is SL2 cross SL2, but it's two copies of real copies of SL2. All right. Is that only for methods? No, 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 no. This is for any p. The, 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 the determinant of L and the determinant of R is, is not. No, they're each, they're each uh, determinant one. So when you take the determinant, uh, determinant of p, determinant of this is that L times that R times that p. Sorry? What is complex numbers? Well, the, you just say that the, 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 that the P mu are complex numbers. Okay? It's not no. something in physics. No, it's not something we see. Other than the fact that all the expressions we encounter for amplitudes immediately make sense for analytic continuations of the, so, they're, so you can naturally complexify them, and it's a very useful thing to uh, complexify. We won't be talking about 
I mean, in a very crucial moment, we'll be talking about it. But that, that, uh, um, yeah. Actually, let me let me let me say say this point again. So, in three comma one signature, it's SL two C, and P looks like what 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 we just wrote. P is just the general Hermitian. Uh, let's say we had two comma two signature, then then I could write P as, uh, I mean, just let me just write it like P0 plus P3, P1 minus P2, there's no I here, P1 plus P2, P0 minus P3. There's no I. And so you notice this is just a completely general real matrix. If I take its determinant, it has two pluses and two minuses. Okay? And so here the, uh, I have two separate SL2s, one on, one, one on the alpha index and one on the alpha dot index. Okay, SL two R. And finally, in general complex, we have SL two C cross SL two C. Okay, so all right. Now let's specialize to the case of massless particles. Now I want to have that p squared is equal to zero. That means that the determinant of this p alpha alpha dot matrix is zero. Now, when the determinant of the two by two matrix is zero, that means it has rank one. So that means that I can write p alpha alpha dot as the outer product of two two dimensional vectors. Okay, and uh, again, just, just to be very explicit, let's say that my momentum is just moving in the z direction. So let's, in that case, my, my matrix would be, my p matrix would look like that, right? p0 is equal to e, p3 equals e. So my matrix looks like that. This is p. And so uh, lambda would be like root 2e0, lambda tilde, would also be root 2e0, set. Okay, yes? The, the set condition that the determinant of L is 1 yes. was motivated by keeping the determinant that it's value. That's right. But now, when the determinant of p is 0, you are released from that. Uh, yeah, well, well you'll, you'll see what that, it's not unrelated to, a, ask that question in five five minutes. Okay, so this is just, uh, so now, what is nice about this is that doing this has allowed us to remove the constraint. It, the normal way of talking about the null momentum is say you have a four vector with a constraint on it, right? The constraint that, uh, that the e squared equals p squared. Now I give you completely unconstrained variables, two completely unconstrained variables, lambda and lambda tilde, and out of them I automatically build uh, a four vector which is null, without putting any constraints on the lambda and lambda tilde at all. Okay, good. But there's a little puzzle. There's a little puzzle, which is, uh, let's just count. I mean, how many degrees of freedom are there in a null four vector? Three, right? You give me the spatial momentum and it determines the energy. But there seems to be four degrees of freedom here. Two in lambda and two in lambda tilde. So what is going on? Well, what's going on is exactly that this formula does not allow me to uniquely choose a lambda to go along with a p. Okay? If you if you write p equals lambda lambda tilde, then I can take lambda and rescale by some t and lambda tilde the opposite and p stays the same. Okay? Now furthermore, let's say that we're in 3-1 signature, ordinary Minkowski space. 
remember in this case, P alpha alpha dot is Hermitian. So we should take lambda tilde alpha dot to be lambda alpha complex conjugate in order for that matrix to be Hermitian. Okay. Otherwise, it won't be a Hermitian matrix. But then T should be a phase. Now, what does that remind you of? There's something, some transformation on some variables that leaves the null momentum invariant and it picks up a phase. That's exactly the little group. That's the conceptual point of these variables. Sometimes in various books and places they're described as, hey, here's a cool way of writing null momenta. Okay, who cares? Uh, but that's not the important point about them. The, I mean, it, it's an important point about them, but the really important point about them is they manifest the action of the little group. Amplitudes are not functions of momenta and polarization vectors, or if they are, they're only redundantly so. Amplitudes are directly functions of spinner helicity variables. Okay? And in fact, uh, you can, we can go through, uh, I, I, I haven't convinced you, I need to, I should in principle convince you that it's literally the same phase as we got from Wigner. Okay? But it is exactly the same phase as you got from Wigner, and, and let me just sketch how you'd go about showing it. You would really go about doing it in ex by basically mimicking exactly the same steps as we did before. Precisely because we can't uniquely associate uh, lambda, lambda tilde, with a P, you start with a reference K, alpha, alpha dot, that you write as lambda for K, alpha, lambda tilde for K, alpha dot. Okay? And then off you go. Then, then you write a P as some L on K, which then allows you to define, so, so, so lambda for P of alpha is defined to be this L alpha beta. Now this is a two by two transformation, lambda beta of K and lambda tilde alpha dot for P is L tilde alpha dot beta dot, lambda tilde beta dot. Uh, on K. And having made this definition, these are definitions just like Wigner, now you can ask what is lambda alpha of some general other Lorentz transformation L on P, and the answer is that this is not equal to L alpha beta lambda beta of P, but it is equal to L alpha beta lambda beta of P and the little group, exactly Wigner's little group transformation. Okay? So this freedom, this, the fact that we can't uniquely associate a lambda and a lambda tilde to the P is exactly uh, allows the lambdas to carry the action of the little group on them. And so practically what that means, sorry, let me just write this down and we'll get to your question, is that the amplitudes from massless particles are functions in these spin helicity variables. Now let me just say one last thing. What are the, the action of the, Lorentz transformations we've already said. So I'll write this as L tilde. And again, if we are really insisting on everything in Minkowski space, L tilde would have to be the complex conjugate of lambda, but it's convenient to really think of everything in the complex, okay? In fact, if you, um, it'll be really useful often to think about it in 2-2 signature if you want to actually visualize things. Uh, but uh, we'll, 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 come to that. Uh, we'll come to that a little bit later. What are the invariants? What are the Lorentz invariants that I can build? Well, these are two by two linear transformations of unit determinant. The only invariant tensors are the epsilon symbol. So the invariants that we can have are, for example, lambda one alpha, lambda two beta, epsilon alpha beta. That is an invariant. This will sometimes be called lambda one, lambda two, uh, with the, these angle brackets. And if there's no confusion, sometimes we'll just even write it as one, two. Okay. And similarly, we have lambda tilde one, alpha dot, lambda tilde two, alpha dot, epsilon alpha dot, beta dot, which is sometimes denoted by square brackets. OK. 
Okay, so these are the invariants. What are some of the invariants we know and love? Like, so uh, here's an invariant we know and love. This is just p1 dot p2. Okay? And you see, it has no weight. When I rescale lambda by t lambda and lambda tilde by t lambda tilde, it has no weight. It doesn't pick up any phase at all, and that's good because the momenta don't pick up any phase at all. Okay? So, if I have just amplitudes for massless particles, now we can write it better. This is a function of the spinner helicity variables. This A is going to run from 1 to n if I have n particles. So this is an amplitude, and it has to be a Lorentz invariant. So it has to be built out of the it has to be built out of angle brackets and square brackets. Okay? And it has to have the property uh, M. It has I have the property that if I rescale the eighth particle by TA for lambda and TA inverse by lambda tilde, I pick up a factor e to the 2i, uh, sorry, uh, TA to the, this is a convention to put a minus sign here, TA to the negative 2HA, uh, um, uh, M of lambda, lambda tilde, and HA. Okay, so let me, this is an important equation, let me just box that. Okay, so this is what, that's the transformation property that the amplitudes have. I use that M can only be written as products of those angles and square brackets. It's any function of them. It has to be a function of them, but it has a function that has picked up a particular weight when you rescale any one of them. That weight tells you what the helicity of the particle is. Right? So, in fact, you don't even have to tell me what the helicities are if you give me an expression. So let's just do some first examples. So let, let me start with a famous amplitude. So here's a famous amplitude. It's called the Park-Taylor amplitude for gluon scattering. So it's 1 minus, 2 plus, 3 minus, 4 plus for gluons. So these, is all, these are all helicity 1, plus or minus 1. Okay? Uh, and this formula is, it happens, it's kind of, it's very special in general, this is not the case, but it's, uh, it's only written in terms of angle brackets. Okay? But let's see from this formula, how do we know uh, that indeed the helicities of the particles are minus 1 and plus 1? So, by the way, first of all, no, just, it's extremely simple. That's the first thing to uh, notice. Um, uh, there's no polarization vectors. Even for this, we do, you do this in problem sets in a field theory course to do like gluon scattering, uh, 2 to 2 gluon scattering even. Um, and uh, there's still some pretty complicated polarization vectors and a complicated numerator. You don't see anything remotely this uh, simple. Okay, um, but, let's, but here we're just doing kinematics. So why do I know particle 1 has uh, helicity minus 1? Because I have to ask what happens when I take T1 lambda 1, T1 inverse lambda tilde 1. It doesn't even depend on lambda tilde 1, so let me rescale lambda 1 to uh, T1 lambda 1. I get T1 to the fourth upstairs. I get T1, T1 downstairs. So this goes to T1 squared times itself. Okay, so good. It has correct homogeneous weight. And from here I read off that, uh, that H1 is equal to minus 1. Okay, so what the helicities are are actually just sitting there in the structure of the answer, the weights that it has under rescaling. So similarly, 3 has helicity minus 1, 2. Uh, when I rescale lambda 2, there's only two 2's downstairs. So I get T2 to the minus 2, and that's why it has helicity plus 1. Right? Another, another uh, comment is here's an illegal formula. That formula makes no sense. Why? Because this term has different homogeneities than this term does. 
Okay? In fact, this guy describes an amplitude where particles 1 and 3 are plus and 2 and 4 are minus. You can't combine expressions that have different helicity weights. Okay? Every weight goes along with a particular set of uh, helicities that you can just read off from, from the weights. Yes? Why can you only use the square and the uh, triangular brackets? I mean, you wrote only epsilon alpha, beta, lambda. Those are the only invariants there are, because the, the Lorentz group is SL2 cross SL2. The only invariant is epsilon. What's wrong and with just lambda alpha, lambda beta? Uh, uh, sorry, lambda alpha, lambda alpha, lambda one alpha times lambda alpha. That's zero. Oh, why? Because, because it's contracted with the epsilon symbol. The lambdas aren't fermions or anything. The lambdas are just like this, or little two vectors. Okay? So, so these brackets are anti-symmetric. So if I take this lambda squared, for example. So if you take lambda alpha, lambda beta, epsilon alpha beta equals zero. This is anti-symmetric. This is symmetric. Okay? So all of these brackets, ij equals negative ji. Okay? All these brackets are anti-symmetric. Why do I need the epsilon? Why can't I, can't I have like delta, well, eta? No, there's no eta. There's no metric. The, 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 the Lorentz transformation is SL2. Okay. The Lorentz trans now, you can think, what is the ordinary eta mu nu? The ordinary eta mu nu, this is a nice exercise. What do you think the ordinary eta mu nu is? So eta mu nu, now each one of these mu's, this is going to be some kind of, some kind of tensor, alpha, beta, alpha dot, beta dot, right? Because each mu is like an alpha, alpha dot. So who do you think this is? This is just epsilon, alpha, beta, epsilon, alpha dot, beta dot. Okay. And that's why if you take P1 dot P2, what we get is exactly this lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda tilde 1, lambda tilde 2. Okay? There's no metric. All of the only thing we have are these brackets and nothing else. Sorry? G squared. <laughs> Out in front of the whole thing. <laughs> huh? Why not 16 pi squared? Uh, I'm not, I, I'm not, we're, we're not yet talking about the couple. I'm just talking about the kinematics of what these uh, expressions uh, look like. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about couplings in, in a little bit. Yeah. Definitely not. Definitely not. Def definitely not. And there are zillions of expressions. So, um, but, uh, but we'll be coming, yeah, so you, you can try to write down some other ones too, okay? Uh, for example, um, if I write this in slightly more familiar language, this looks like this over S times T, okay? So you see that this makes manifest that, that 1 and 2 of helicity minus 1, and uh, 1 and 3 of helicity minus 1, and 2 and 4 of helicity plus one, but here it's a very particular function of the Mandelstam variables, s and t. As far as the helicity weights are concerned, I could take any function, any function of s and t, and that would be fine as far as the, as far as the weights are concerned. In fact, that's what we're going to do later. So we're, we're, we're uh, uh, actually we're done, <laughs> but, uh, but we're going to, um, uh, yeah, that's right, yes. Uh, uh, um, uh, but what, 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 what we're going to do is just learn how to write down three particle amplitudes. Those will turn out to be completely fixed by symmetries. There's nothing you can do about them up to overall strength of the coupling constant. And then four particle amplitudes that are not, they're not fixed, right? They're just like we see in these examples, they're, they're, they're not fixed. But that's where you put in, so, so symmetries, Poincare invariance fixes the structure of the three particle amplitudes. That and locality and unitarity in the most sort of primitive sense uh, tells us something about the structure of the four-particle amplitude and tells us the four-particle amplitude has to have poles in particular places and has to factorize in a particular way on those poles. That's what turns the problem into a completely algebraic one. The three-particle amplitudes you can have for any theory, spin 17 million, anything, but now you have to demand that the objects that you build in that way can go along with four-particle amplitudes that factorize appropriately, have poles in the correct place and they factorize correctly. And that turns it into a kind of like a quadratic equation, and, uh, and we'll solve that quadratic equation. We'll see that almost everything is inconsistent other than the theories that we know and love. Okay? That's, uh, uh, yeah? You know, the, originally, the Park-Taylor was the 
derived using a very convoluted reasoning. Yes, 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 yes. Supersymmetry. So now you're saying this is a red herring. Oh, yes, yes. Well, we're going to derive it. I mean, uh, nothing uh, in, to do with supersymmetry. No. No, it's nothing to do with supersymmetry. We're, we're, we're going to derive, as I said, we'll, we'll, I was hoping to do it today, but it's not going to happen. Uh, but what we, we can really do, like most of the 2 to 2 amplitudes in the standard model, like uh, by this one, one method. So we'll certainly be deriving the, the, this, this formula in the next lecture. Sorry? Not to all orders, because uh, w what order you're in, whether it's trees or loops, is reflected in the kind of function that you have. Okay, so if you have trees, then the kind of functions you have is sort of obvious from the Feynman diagrams. They only have poles. That's the approximation in which we're a weak coupling. Uh, and in that approximation is when we're going to be able, be able to do all the things uh, that I, that but, I but said. Okay, in general, amplitudes have more complicated functional dependence on the variables. They have branch cuts, they're more complicated functions. So this is an approximation? That was a, that, that's the tree level formula. Okay? That is the tree level so formula. But it does indeed sum up all the Feynman diagrams. Okay? So all the tree level of Feynman diagrams. That you wrote, F of S and that's right. It, 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 so, so we're going to make, so we're, we're going to be able to do all the things that I said cleanly by just assuming that the function F only has poles. That in conventional language means tree level. Um, we would like to be able to say something very generally about what the kinds of functions are that show up um, uh, at loop level, even non-perturbatively, non, non but that's a famously hard problem that still has not been solved. But I mean, it's, uh, will also contain, yes. Uh, yes, that's right. The F will, so, so at tree level, it just looks like g squared over st. Okay, and, then at, uh, and then at loop level, it'll look like g to the fourth with some logarithm or some dilogarithm. It'll get more and more complicated. <laughs> We have not said anything about that. We're going to see that next time when we talk about factorization, because there's going to be a coupling constant in the three-particle amplitude. The only part that's not determined is the overall strength. And then when we factorize, that tells us that the four-particle amplitude is, involves the square of those, the products of those uh, three, three particle ones. OK, so uh, let me just, uh, uh, let me just, uh, just write this down. Um, so we, we just did, for massless, uh, we said that we have P alpha alpha dot is lambda alpha, lambda tell alpha dot. Um, and the little group was uh, lambda to T lambda, lambda tilde to T inverse lambda tilde is the little group. What if we have massive particles? If we have massive particles, P, the determinant of P is not zero. So P is just some rank two thing. Okay, so that means, since it's rank 2, that we can write it as lambda alpha i, lambda tilde alpha dot, capital I, where i runs from 1 to 2. Just as before, these are not unique, because I can do any SU2 transformation on them, and I leave p invariant. Okay, so lambda alpha i goes to some l i j lambda j alpha and similarly on on lambda tilde alpha dot this is an s u2 transformation and this is also the massive little group so that's it amplitudes for massless particles are functions of lambdas and lambda tildes for massive particles their function of a lambda with a second index on it, okay, a lambda alpha i. Now, there are some little constraints. The, uh, the fact that p squared equals m squared means that, uh, that if I take the determinant of lambda alpha i, lambda j beta, epsilon alpha beta, oops, <coughs> that this is equal to m times epsilon ij, and similarly for a lambda tilde. I have the downstairs index. It, it doesn't matter. I can move it. Well, here, let me put it downstairs since I put it downstairs. So there. But 
that's it. So now we've learned and that, that, that the amplitudes, now for a massive particle, we'll have 2s indices. For massless particles, they'll have helicity. For the massive particles, there are functions of lambda i uh, and lambda tilde alpha dot with the downstairs, uh, with these indices. Upstairs or downstairs, it doesn't matter. Uh, and for the massive, for the massless case, just lambda and lambda tilde. And they have to have the property for particle one. Uh, you, one way or another, you have to get two s of these lambdas involved. So you have two s of those indices, and they have to be totally symmetrized. Okay, and for the massless guys, you just have to ensure that they have the correct weight. All right, so that's it. Um, that's it for the most trivial aspect of the kinematics. Um, so we at least know what the variables are, both massless and massive. Um, and you'll notice that there's no, uh, there's no four by four matrices, there's no gamma matrices. We're, not, we're never going to see anything other than these SU2 tensor indices, okay? Um, uh, uh, and uh, it, it's probably worth your while at some point in your, in your life to just uh, redo your undergraduate SU2 education in the trivial language of symmetric tensors of SU2, okay? It's much, much less fancy than all the other things that you know how, how to do, but it's just, it'll be good for your soul to like uh, unify uh, these uh, different ways of uh, thinking about things. So it's very useful, it's very, it's critical in this business, okay? Uh, uh, to use this uh, formalism, yes? Yes, th th this, as I said, this is all, everything I said in this, in this lecture and, and the next lecture too is in, in, in a paper uh, called uh, uh, Scattering Amplitudes for All Masses and Spins that, that I wrote with Yutin Huang and Chuchu Huang uh, back in 2017. I forget the, the archive reference, but it's, uh, it's 2017. And, uh, and the first appendix does SU2. In the, I mean, does uh, does this trivial thing is there that I just mentioned? For dimension? Sorry. Is there an analog for different dimension? Yes, it gets uh, um, uh, it gets uh, uh, it gets harder as you go to higher dimensions. But six five and si really six dimensions, three three is really easy. Three is even easier than four because in three dimensions you just have p as lambda lambda. So there's no even lambda tildes, okay? Now notice that's very nice because that immediately tells you something that you know, it's a slightly deep, slightly deep fact from Lagrangians and so on, um, that in three dimensions, you don't have any such thing as a massless spin one particle. All you have in three dimensions for massless particles are bosons and fermions, that's it. And you see that very clearly because there's no helicity, room for helicity. P is lambda lambda, and the only thing that can happen is, uh, is you pick up a sign or not when you, when you uh, uh, there's no rephasing, okay? Uh, and, that, and that's what allows Goldstone bosons to be the same as uh, gauge, gauge bosons in, in three dimensions and so on, okay? So that's, uh, um, so, in, uh, so four dimensions, we have lambda and lambda tilde, and six dimensions, it's also, uh, there's, there's an analog of P equals lambda, lambda tilde, um, with a little bit of a constraint on it, and then, in, in higher dimensions, there's more constraints. So, so it's uh, so four dimensions is really the sort of sweet spot where there is something non-trivial. Well, it's really the, the 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 invariant fact is that the simplest. If someone asks you what's the simplest two simplest Lie groups in the world, you'd say U1 and then SU2, and that's just a nice fact of life that in four dimensions those are the little groups. For massless particles, it's U1. For massive particles, it's SU2, and so that's why life is as simple as possible. So, and so these, these, these variables are manifesting the action of those simplest possible little groups in, in 4D. Any further questions, anyone? Okay, let's thank you.